A very warm welcome to uh, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and to this seminar on NATO-Swedish uh, partnership in a new era. My name is Anna Wislander and I'm a Deputy Director here at the Institute and it's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion. If you want to join the conversation on Twitter, please do and uh, use the hashtag behind me, UI event. In 1994, a few years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Sweden decided to join a new initiative called Partnership for Peace, PFP, for Europe, Southern Caucasus and Central Asia. And it was uh, quite a remarkable step. What had been completely unthinkable from a Swedish perspective, a military non-aligned country during the Cold War, to cooperate open with, uh, openly with NATO was, uh, then became a fact. And the main argument for the government at that time was that the PFP offered an opportunity for Sweden to contribute to a common European security order and thereby strengthen also uh, the role and uh, the respect for the UN Charter. Sweden has and had at that time a long tradition of participating in UN peacekeeping missions. And uh, as a military non-aligned country though, our national defense uh, was uh, largely built on Swedish standards and procedures. And the PFP became a framework for cooperation, both in a broader sense, but also regionally, uh, since all countries around the Baltic Sea participated uh, in this cooperation. Mostly the PFP became a tool for developing uh, capacity for international missions and to participate in more uh, demanding such with a peace, peace enforcement mandate. And over this period of uh, 20 years, Sweden has participated in all UN-mandated uh, NATO-led operations in Bosnia, in Kosovo, Afghanistan, and uh, Libya. And uh, this has been a step-by-step -step process. Uh, during those first years in the mid-1990s, I worked with the Partnership for Peace at the Ministry of Defense, and actually we had uh, quite uh, heated discussions on uh, whether jet fighters could participate in PFP exercises. And uh, after a few years, they were allowed, but not from the start. And uh, things developed, and in 2011, Sweden participated with jet fighters in the international mission in Libya. So, um, this has been a, an ongoing process. What we have now is that the common European security order is trembling. And at the NATO summit in Wales in September 2014, uh, this issue was addressed and a series of decisions were taken in order to respond to that. Focus is now on strengthening collective defense and also to building stability together with partners. As a result of the summit, Sweden has an opportunity to strengthen cooperation with NATO uh, within uh, a tailor-made program called the EOP. So we will uh, learn today how this uh, partnership is developing and uh, how NATO is implementing the decisions from the NATO summit. What importance do partners play and how can the enhanced opportunity program strengthen the cooperation in Europe today? It's a great honor and we're very happy to welcome uh, James Apathera, Dep Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy and uh, NATO Secretary General's Special Representative for the Caucasus and Central Asia. Unfortunately, uh, Jan Solestrand, State Secretary, uh, had to cancel uh, his participation today at short notice, but uh, we are very, very happy that we could uh, replace him with uh, Håkan Malmqvist, who is uh, Swedish ambassador at uh, Sweden's mission to NATO. So we have two uh, prominent visitors here from Brussels today giving their perspectives. So a very warm welcome to both of you, and we will start with uh, James, please. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here again. I think this is actually my third uh, visit to this institute, and it is always a very pleasant experience. So I am uh, very happy to be here and to talk about this 
a particular subject uh, and also to do it uh, with the uh, very talented ambassador that you have to NATO who will I'm sure uh, give a, a complimentary but maybe different uh, perspective. Uh, let me uh, try to be succinct because I think the discussion that we'll have together uh, which you will moderate uh, will be much more interesting. Uh, so having worked for uh, not a uh, Swede that maybe for the future, but uh, for a Dane, um, I have, when I come to Scandinavia, Rasmussen always said three points, always use three points, uh, so I will have three points uh, in case it also applies here. Uh, first, what is the security environment that NATO sees now, which is obviously relevant for our partners and our partnership? Second, uh, how is our partnership in general evolving? Uh, and third, of course, NATO-Sweden relations. Um, first, on how we see the world now. And I think this is something which everybody is debating and, and which I was debating with Swedish colleagues just earlier today. Uh, I think the main security focus for NATO is in two directions now. It's east and south. And, uh, you know, you could say very much that the threats have come a lot closer to our borders and that is focusing our minds. Um, the uh, turning to the east for a moment. We have come to the end of a period where the West, if no, now we have to use that word again, uh, has tried very hard to uh, help Russia enter the Euro-Atlantic security structures and global security structures in a way that paid respect to Russia's importance uh, and the potential of uh, partnership. So we created in NATO the NATO-Russia Council and gave Russia an equal vote and had all sorts of cooperation in many areas. But it wasn't just NATO, obviously. Uh, the EU embraced partnership with Russia. We created the G8. We, the broader international community, invited Russia into the World Trade Organization. Of course, it had to, to meet the requirements of it. But there was really, I think, a, a broad effort uh, to uh, create a new inclusive security structure that included Russia, and it has not worked. Uh, what we have now is a Russia that seems, I think quite obviously, to reject uh, the broad elements of the outcome of the Cold War and to want to change them. Uh, it has given itself in law the right to intervene uh, in other countries, including militarily, uh, where there are Russian nationals or Russian passport holders, ethnic Russians, historic Russian lands is another expression. I saw a quote from the deputy prime minister who said uh, recently that Russia has the right to reclaim its lost colonies, by which he was apparently referring to Alaska, and I wish him all the luck. Uh, but. Um, what we have is a, a revanchist Russia. That, so the idea that this will stop, that they just want one thing, is not something which we in NATO believe is the case. When it comes to borders, when it comes to the political independence of European states, when it comes to the arms control agreements on which European security has been founded for so many years, when it comes to the freedom of the European Union to engage with partners, when it comes to the freedom of partners to engage with EU or NATO, Russia rejects those things now and will work including militarily to stop it and is investing very heavily in its military and in, uh, in new forms of military uh, activity to enforce that vision. So we are now in for a struggle if we want to preserve the principles and values which have underpinned European security for quite some time. So what are we doing about it? We are in NATO uh, doing two things. One is reinforcing our own security uh, through the readiness action plan and other steps to sort of make sure that our defense is very strong. And second is reaching out to European democracies and European countries to try to help them maintain their political independence. And I don't mean uh, political independence to be they have to join NATO or they have to join the EU. Uh, and the proof of that is actually Ukraine. When Ukraine uh, chose to work towards NATO membership prior to 2008, we accepted that. When Ukraine chose uh, non-aligned status, we accepted that too. And actually we'd had more cooperation with Ukraine when it was non-aligned than before. Uh, so we don't mean join us, but we mean you don't need to be forced to join someone else. So we want to help them do that and we can discuss that. We do that, by the way, together with our most developed partners, including Sweden. 
just to finish on that point, we're also working very hard on developing defenses against what we call hybrid warfare, the new Russian model uh, for which they have stood up a whole headquarters, which combines all elements of state power, energy, uh, propaganda attacks, cyber attacks, the use of uh, little green men, as they call them, unmarked forces, etc., etc. Uh, so we can discuss that more if you want. Second priority is the South uh, and all the instability that comes from not just Syria uh, and Iraq, but also now Libya. And in fact, what you can see across the South is a cocktail of uh, violence, insurgent groups, open borders, proliferation of small arms and light weapons, uh, and weak uh, or governments that have difficulty uh, controlling all of their territory. So we in NATO do not have a lead role in addressing many of these challenges. Uh, the problem is nobody really knows the lead role. The coalition is, as you know, um, involved in, in Iraq and to a lesser extent in Syria. Uh, but we are looking at how NATO can also contribute to this. And to my mind, but this is not a necessarily agreed NATO position, to my mind, one of the most significant contributions NATO can make, including with partners, is to take away ungoverned space. Uh, jihadi groups go to ungoverned space. Uh, they've done it in Syria, they've done it in Iraq, they've done it in Libya, but they also do it in Yemen, they also do it in Nigeria. Uh, so where they can find it, they go to it and they pose a threat to us. So defense capacity building or institution building uh, to help local governments and local regional institutions provide for their own security and take away that uh, ungoverned space is, to my mind, a significant contribution to the fight against this threat and the threat that it poses not just to the people there, which is very significant, but to us as well. Third priority is operations. Uh, we are still in Afghanistan uh, with the Resolute Support Mission. It's a train, advise and assist mission. It's much smaller. Uh, and as you know, it's supposed to last for two years. You also know there's a debate going on as to whether the Afghan government can manage on its own after two years. So we'll see where that all goes. But Sweden is a very valued partner for us uh, in this operation. Fourth priority you will see coming soon. Uh, and that is as we look to the summit in Warsaw in June, we will start to think about NATO's future transformation. We have to implement what happened in Wales, all the decisions that Anna mentioned, but we also have to look to the future. And that will include, I think, a very fundamental discussion on European security. The principles on which our strategic concept and political guidance and NATO-Russia Founding Act are based are questioned by some. They say, okay, that's nice five years ago, but that's not what we have now. So uh, there will be a very active discussion about that. Okay, so that's the fourth of the fifth priorities. The fifth is partnership. And I don't mean that it's the fifth in order. It just meant I had a nice flow to my second point. So that's why I put it fifth. Um, first point I want to make on partnership is partnership is fully part now of NATO's DNA. You don't have to convince anyone of the value to NATO of partnership across the board on uh, political consultation, on military preparedness, meaning exercises and interoperability, for operations themselves, on intel cooperation. We now do this as a matter of course because we are convinced after the experience that we've had that cooperation with our partners is good for our security as much as it is good for uh, partner security. So it's 50% self-interest as much as it is uh, interest in helping uh, our partners. So it is win-win. Uh, we have also won a lot through the Afghanistan operation. A very high level of political consultation on a regular basis, including at the top level. Uh, a high level of military interoperability, uh, which is uh, very, very valuable, not just in the NATO context. The coalition that's fighting in Syria and Iraq is using NATO standard. And we have 40 partners around the world, military and political partners, uh, who use NATO standard. And even countries like Ukraine, which are, of course, torn politically, are embracing NATO standard because that has become the global standard So uh, for highland military operations. And we won very good uh, cooperation with other international organizations, the UN, the EU in particular, uh, and we want to keep it. So we also want to keep and will keep the 
menu of political tools, or sorry, military and technical tools that we use to embrace daily cooperation, training, education, all the things that we do with our partners uh, that they choose to do, and a big exercise program, which we will also implement. But we have put in place some new tools. One is what we call the interoperability platform. We want to keep this high level of military interoperability. So we've invited 24 countries around the table with our 28, 24 partners. And on a regular basis, on the military side, on the civilian side, we're discussing how to ensure that our forces can still work together. And we have a training and exercise schedule to maintain that. Second, we have the Enhanced Opportunities Program. And Anna mentioned that that's kind of the highest level of uh, partnership for us. There are five countries. Uh, that have been invited to be in this program and they've been invited to be in it because they are the most interoperable, the most capable, the highest contributing uh, and in many ways the closest um, to us uh, and of course values are a very important part of that. Uh, and we will discuss that, I think, in more detail and Hokan will discuss it in much more detail uh, and probably better than I know it. Let me mention though uh, two other relations that we want to deepen. One is NATO-EU. And we do a lot with the European Union in terms of capability development, for example. Uh, we have operational cooperation in a few theaters. The new element is, again, hybrid. Uh, a possible hybrid threat to one of our countries where neither the EU alone nor NATO alone have the tools to defend effectively against it. So we need, and again this is my view, but I think it's also the view of the, the NATO governments, uh, we need much deeper cooperation with the European Union uh, to figure out who does what when, in what order, against a possible hybrid threat against one of our countries. Uh, those of you who have worked in NATO or EU issues know that NATO-EU cooperation is extremely complicated for political reasons. Uh, but I am convinced we need to overcome this because it's, n it's okay to have complicated relations for discretionary cooperation somewhere far away from home. It is not okay when it's here and it's our countries and our citizens, we have to find a way past these things, so we're working on it. And then there's the, the UN relationship. The UN is now taking on a very new role, or at least it's taking on missions that have broader responsibilities than it has had for quite some time. Higher level of combat requirements. Uh, and they are looking to allies and also to NATO for more support, for training, on how to protect their forces, how to integrate high-level uh, technologies like drones into their operations, how to provide training, uh, for example, to deal with uh, roadside bombs, IEDs as we call them. We have unfortunately quite a lot of experience in that from Afghanistan and the e UN is now facing that where it goes. So we are providing training to their personnel before they deploy into the field from our centers of excellence based on that experience. So we will work on that more and more. Okay, now. I come to the third point, and that is NATO Sweden. Uh, and then I will uh, turn the floor over to Hoka. Uh, the first point to make is exactly where uh, Anna started. Uh, Sweden is one of our closest partners. And why? Because we share values. Because we share a commitment to the Charter of the United Nations and the principles therein. Because Sweden, like NATO, actually wants to do something to defend those principles, even when it gets a little bit difficult. Uh, and so we really see things very much the same way and can work together effectively. Uh, what we get from that is we get Sweden. What you get or what Sweden gets from that is access to developing NATO strategy, access to NATO's military command structure and the use of it for operations, and therefore to amplify its influence in the region and in the world. Uh, and by the way, in full respect of Sweden's non-aligned status, military neutrality, uh, we have no problems in either direction operating uh, in the political context that we have now. But what's new? An EOP, Enhanced Opportunities Program, is the centerpiece. Uh, what's new is there is a much greater focus on close to home. And I think that is uh, shaping a lot of what we do. Uh, we are now much closer to home. Uh, and uh, 
We have had, for example, very recently work together on analyzing the security threats in the Baltic Sea with proper political analysis, intelligence exchange, and we are now analyzing that on the military side and we will have a new discussion with Sweden and Finland on this issue uh, to see what the threat is and what kind of cooperation could be required to uh, secure, better secure our, our region. Uh, second, we have much broader and ever broader political consultation. Uh, just yesterday, Samantha Power, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. was in NATO headquarters and uh, came to discuss it with the NATO allies uh, very important issues related to ISIS, uh, security in Syria and Iraq, uh, the situation with Russia and how the U.S. sees it, U.N., U.N. reform, U.N. balance. And we did that with our five ELP partners uh, sitting at the table as participants uh, in the discussion, but we have had discussions and cooperation on cyber defense, on Russia's strategic communications, or I would say propaganda strategy in all of our countries as part of its overall hybrid uh, attack, and uh, on the south, that's coming soon. And uh, more and more, our partners, including Sweden, our closest partners, are participating in these political consultations. I expect we will have that at ministerial level in the coming months as well. We have more for our EOP partners, including Sweden, more predictable access to NATO's structures, NATO's exercises, the NATO response force. Uh, right now, Sweden is participating in a crisis management exercise. It's virtual, not real, but it's important for us. And when we have future exercises, Sweden will be part of those, uh, including the high visibility ones, as well as I mentioned the interoperability platform. Uh, and all of this, of course, is supporting the hardest military element, which is the NATO response force in which Sweden participates and the readiness action plan. This is NATO's sort of defense of its own territory uh, capability, but we want to see how to associate our closest partners with that as well, and we'll discuss that with your ambassador and, and others. Uh, we welcome, I wanted to say this uh, before closing, uh, by the way, the cooperation that Sweden has with other regional countries, uh, the Nordic cooperation, Nordic-Baltic cooperation, it's all complicated ge geometry, but it's all about deepening partnership and dialogue between allies and partners, and we fully support that. So, uh, to conclude, uh, there really is a lot going on. Uh, more political dialogue, more intelligence sharing, more analysis, more exercising, operational cooperation. Uh, it doesn't mean decision-making. We have consultation and decision shaping. Sweden does not take decisions at NATO on any of these issues. That's only for the allies. It, there's a lot of training and exercising and closeness. It does not mean security guarantees. NATO, Sweden doesn't ask for them and NATO doesn't provide them to non-partners, to non-allies. Uh, but we really have ever closer dialogue and cooperation. That's the direction we want to go in. It's the direction we're working to go in uh, together uh, with Sweden. A lot of this is based on Sweden's own initiatives and ideas. And uh, as I just said to your ambassador, I think we're actually turning a corner towards much deeper and better cooperation in full respect of the political framework of this country. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, James, for that excellent presentation. And um, Håkan, uh, I'll leave the floor to you for the Swedish perspectives. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here. Thank you, Anna. And thanks to the Foreign Policy Institute. And congratulations to all your successful activities. Um, I'm a bit of the party spoiler here, I guess, um, coming in at a late stage, replacing the state secretary. It's an offer you can't refuse, of course, as an ambassador. Um, and uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here together with uh, Assistant Secretary General and his team from, from NATO. Um, I'm the ambassador to NATO since September uh, last year. Before that, I spent five years in Greece, so it's from one interesting area to another. <laughs> Um, and um, 
what what could possibly be added uh, after James uh, overview I think it was uh, gave us most of what we what we need for our discussions and to to make sure well Sol uh, state secretary Solistran has has um, I think he had a rendezvous with the flu and and we wish him good health and a speedy recovery um, I have to rely on a script to make sure I don't deviate too much from what the state secretary would have told you so if you could bear with me I have to rely on that as well um, I, I'm, I'm sure James was right in, in trying to make three points I will try to do the same or three parts uh, I will start saying a few words on the security policy context then going into the current cooperation NATO Sweden and then focusing lastly on the Enhanced Opportunities Program, the EOP, which we have heard about. So, um, starting out with the security policy context, we've heard uh, about it. Um, and as you know, Swedish security policy rests on the notion of joint security challenges. What we might face, others will as well. And the situation in our neighborhood makes it necessary to strengthen our defense capabilities uh, and we're continuing to develop our military cooperation with Finland, uh, with other Nordic neighbors, with the Baltic countries, and with NATO. In NATO, we, together with Finland and others, are now taking new steps as part of an upgraded partnership, what is called EOP, Enhanced Opportunities Program. The European security architecture presents um, various platforms, organizational platforms, but in the end, uh, it's the European states themselves um, constituting the core for capability development, level of ambition and decision-making. The interdependence between the European states as well as the transatlantic relation makes enhanced security and defense cooperation a uh, prerequisite for a durable, effective and solidarity-based policy. Now, NATO is a key actor for European security and integration, as well as for international crisis management. Uh, and Sweden's cooperation with NATO is crucial for the development of a relevant, modern, flexible, and operational national armed forces. And we want to be fully interoperable with NATO allies, since interoperability is critical in order to tackle future security challenges together, be it in our neighborhood or far away. On Russia, well, the illegal Russian annexation of parts of Ukraine has underlined the need for cooperative security in Europe, as well as the importance of the transatlantic link. It also highlights the importance of political unity and cooperation among allies, but also between allies and partners to deal with the challenge that Russia's behavior poses to the European security order. In this regard, Sweden has welcomed the measures taken by NATO in support of European security, including in the Baltic Sea region. And in addition to the east-north dimension, uh, the deteriorating situation in the southern neighborhood is of great concern, of course, and calls for joint efforts and dialogue between allies and partners as well. Now, to the current Sweden-NATO cooperation. Um, since Sweden joined the partnership in 94, as Anna mentioned, uh, our partnership has gradually evolved. And over the last decade, this has primarily been driven by our common efforts um, and needs in military operations abroad. Uh, Kosovo, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Libya, and the necessity to be interoperable partners uh, in the field, that is. Now, our cooperation needs to be maintained and adapted to new developments, which uh, James um, presented. Uh, NATO is at the core of the international cooperation aiming at developing military capability and instruments for crisis management. The technical standards, the staff routines and methods that forms the base for military contributions um, are all developed within this cooperation regardless if these missions are led by the UN, the EU, or NATO. Ensuring that we have the best possible 
conditions for interoperability and capability development is a basic demand for our future operational and exercise uh, contributions. And this is why our partnership with NATO is a prerequisite for Swedish military contributions to complex operations. And the cooperation with NATO furthermore supports the development of our own military capability, thereby adding to the enhancement of the defense of Sweden. In order to maintain what has already been achieved uh, and to further develop our capabilities and the possibility to work together with others, uh, Sweden's partnership with NATO has widened as well as deepened over the years. And at present, Sweden participates, for example, in uh, and or contributes to the NATO response force uh, with the reserve forces pool. Uh, we uh, are participants in the NATO Connected Forces Initiative. Uh, we, have, uh, we are in programs for interoperability that NATO provides with the PARP, the OCC, the ENF, the I interoperability platform. And in addition, um, from the outset, Sweden has supported the Alliance in its work to implement and operationalize the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. Uh, we have also continuously supported Alliance efforts within defense security sector reform and capacity building, which James mentioned. And, um, as you know, uh, last September in Wales, we signed um, the host nation support MOU with NATO, and this was an important step towards increasing Sweden's ability to be part of training, exercises, and operations. And the HNS MOU will come into effect, as you know, uh, once the Swedish Parliament has adopted the necessary legislation. And this is scheduled, I think, to be finalized in 2016. Now, to focus a little bit finally on the uh, developing cooperation of the Enhanced Opportunities Program. Um, at the Wales Summit, um, NATO delivered a substantial plan for reinforcing its collective defence, um, under pressure, of course, by one of the most serious crises we have faced since the Cold War era. But uh, at the summit also, uh, two new partnership initiatives were launched. One was the interoperability platform, 28 plus 24. And the other, and of particular importance for us, um, the enhanced opportunities for five countries at the time, Sweden, Finland, uh, Australia, Georgia, and Jordan. Uh, and those partners having substantially contributed to NATO-led operations and shown a serious commitment to develop and maintain a high level of interoperability. Uh, this is a much welcomed approach that we believe can serve as a vehicle for a more tailor-made individual and structured partnership with NATO. For the Alliance, uh, I guess the added value will be uh, partners who more effectively and substantially can contribute uh, to the work of the 28 Allies. Now, substance should, of course, define the format. So NATO 28 plus 5, uh, as we see it, is one option for the future. Uh, partners who have been granted EU peace status have all qualified for the deepened relations, but cooperation should be developed on each participant's own individual merits uh, and depending on the issues, of course, at hand. The basis for EUP uh, is that it should be mutually beneficial for both the partner countries involved and for NATO. And with that follows, of course, a joint responsibility to concretize uh, this enhanced partnership. And the, the months after Wales, the Wales Summit, uh, I think, were characterized by an internal follow-up process among the 28 members. You had a lot to think about and a lot to take stock from uh, after the Wales Summit. Uh, but with 2015, I think we've seen a kind of kickstart uh, with meetings at uh, the NAC ambassadorial level, with the, at the deputy level. We've had uh, the operational level shape. We have had working group level meetings. Uh, uh, but we are still in the beginning. Uh, 
and it's, I think it's necessary to keep in mind that EOP is a new way of working and thinking, both for us and uh, for the Allies. Uh, <clears throat> so, what does EUP entail more in detail? And this, uh, I have six points. I, I, I choose to mention six points <laughs> within the three points. So, this is point three and six sub points. Uh, well, from our point of view, regular political consultations, uh, and that could include uh, at the ministerial level. Uh, could mean re regional security issues, in particular in our own neighborhood, uh, um, in light of the Russian aggression in and around Ukraine. The Baltic Sea region is becoming more important for NATO, as, as uh, James stated. Um, and we would like a continued exchange of views with NATO on the strategic situation in our region, as well as on concrete activities. <coughs> um, you mentioned also more global themes, crisis management, hybrid threats, uh, maritime security, cyber defense, uh, arms control, including confidence building measures and, and transparency. Um, and uh, you mentioned also EU and NATO, and I think we also have an interest in, of course, challenges which are topical both in the EU and in, in NATO. Uh, the situation in our southern neighborhood, uh, ISIL, North Africa, etc., and interoperability issues, including the NRF reform. Secondly, pre-recognition as potential operational partners, which means uh, it would allow us uh, earlier access to pre-crisis consultations and operational planning, updates, and assessments. Um, an early involvement from our side, pre preferably during the early phases of generic planning, uh, would enable us to provide substantial and timely resources to make and to make necessary priorities. Uh, thirdly, assured participation in exercises, and we heard about that, uh, exercises open to partners as appropriate, NRF exercises including early stage planning. Um, uh, and to maximize the alliance's gain from partner interaction, we need timely and reciprocal access to relevant uh, activities and tools, of course. Um, high intensity exercises such as VGTF, and you mentioned uh, the HVE 18, the, the high visibility exercise hosted by Norway, uh, is a priority as well. Uh, and um, also possible, uh, cooperation uh, that might be extended to partners concerning the readiness action plan. Fourth, uh, the possibility for partner nations to staff current or new positions at NATO headquarters uh, and the NATO command structure uh, as deemed appropriate by the military council. We wish to increase our presence in the military structures of NATO uh, through relevant secondments. And uh, that, that could be also, uh, of course, to the civilian the political side of, of, of NATO. Fifth, access to and participation in joint analysis and lessons learned process. Um, we think uh, this is important uh, the, since this will be the platform for both national and joint future planning. Um, we have a long-standing and constructive cooperation between the Swedish Armed Forces and the Joint Analysis Lessons Learned Center at, at NATO. And uh, here we think of exercises, host nation support, a new NATO response force, uh, uh, capacity building, defense security sector reform, etc. And finally, the sixth point, uh, information exchange and enhance situational awareness in accordance with current and future agreed procedures and modalities. Uh, knowledge is power, uh, as it is said, and, and we will be able to do more and better individually and jointly if we share information uh, on relevant issues. And in short, to, to uh, operationalize the enhanced opportunities for Sweden, our initial priorities would be uh, one, a continued political dialogue with NATO on issues of mutual interest, security in the Baltic Sea region being of particular interest. Two, assured participation in exercises, 
and as appropriate NRF exercises, uh, including early stage planning, and three, pre-recognition as a potential operational partner for future operations to allow for earlier access to pre-crisis consultations. This is work in progress, and we, we realize that this is not possible to do next week, uh, but this is um, the sort of short-term priorities which we put into this. Okay, um, opportunities multiply as they are seized, someone said, and this could be a proper guiding principle, I think, for, for the future cooperation between Sweden and NATO. Uh, within the framework of PFP and with the added partner formats, uh, Sweden and NATO can benefit mutually by expanding further our existing cooperation. Uh, and I have pointed out a few ideas and priorities from a Swedish point of view. So let's discuss this now. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Håkan, for that uh, excellent overview from uh, Swedish perspectives. And uh, not only an overview, but also uh, a few. Uh, no, we'll have that. Thanks very much. Quite a few uh, concrete suggestions uh, that we perhaps could get a response from um, James on, on those uh, suggestions, if those uh, sounds like uh, good next steps for developing the partnership. Um, and in discussing this, yeah, well, get, let's, let's get a quick response on, on uh, those, those issues, those priorities that uh, Håkan said. Continue political dialogue, assured exercises access, and uh, um, pre-defined for operational partners. Well, basically, I agree. So I can give a, a short answer to that. But in fact, uh, as Hokan said, it's work that's underway already. I think the one piece that is sort of next for us to accomplish on the political consultation is the ministerial level. Uh, and we have two ministerial meetings coming up, uh, one in uh, May, one in June. Uh, and it is an active discussion to uh, find a way to include in a useful discussion, useful uh, in both directions, uh, ministers, either ministers of foreign affairs or ministers of defense or both uh, in, um, in our meetings. I think it ambassadorial level we're doing pretty well. Uh, what I believe we need to continue doing is broadening the list of topics and as we were just discussing to ensure that these are topics which in general are of not just of interest but of value uh, between our, our EOP partners and, uh, and NATO. In other words, what was so uh, advantageous and has been about the uh, Baltic Sea discussion is um, that Sweden and Finland have not just a, a challenge which we share, but also can bring to the allies their perspective, their intelligence, their information, their uh, analysis, which you know we can then share and we can have follow-on work. And this is where I really value that particular uh, issue. On participation uh, in our exercises, I don't frankly see much of a challenge. We just have to work out the modalities when it comes to the NRF and its linkage to the readiness action plan. And then we, uh, because, sorry, just to mention that the NATO response force is being adapted. It's getting bigger. Uh, it's getting a very high readiness brigade that can move in a couple of days to wherever it needs to go. Uh, and so we need to adapt everything associated with that and to see how partners can participate. So that's what we're, the modalities we're working on now. So basically, I think all of this will happen. It's all in hand, uh, but we welcome the fact that this uh, is being you know, supported by, by Sweden. And I really have to stress that many of the ideas that are in the Enhanced Opportunities Program are ideas that have come from Sweden and from Finland uh, who uh, offered intellectual uh, energy and political pressure uh, to get the things that they thought was were most appropriate, and we agree that they are appropriate. That's like, uh, what comes to my mind when I listen to this is that the EOP uh, countries, five of them, are, uh, I mean, it's Sweden and Finland, but then it's also Jordan, Georgia, Australia, isn't it? So that's, uh, if you take the NATO members, 28, plus this group, hmm. it's... Uh, 
yeah, various geographic positions, various interests, various uh, level of interoperability and so on. Um, but would you foresee a possibility, we discussed uh, Baltic Sea uh, um, instantly, and this program is supposed to be tailor-made, could um, in the future NATO meet with only Sweden and Finland and thereby linking uh, this deeper cooperation we have bilaterally, for instance, or is, is that not yeah. within reach? And in fact, that's already happening. Uh, so you're quite right. And, and Håkan made a very important point that I should have made, and that is that this is tailor-made, exactly as you said. Each of these relationships is on an individual basis. Uh, there are times when having all five together makes sense. And one of those times is when we discuss the South, uh, by which I mean ISIS and ISIL. Why? Because if you, Australia, you have a big foreign fighter problem. Georgia has a big foreign fighter problem. Maybe a small foreign fighter problem, but it has one, as we all do. Uh, and I know this country does uh, as well. And uh, Jordan, it's obvious. Uh, so there are issues where it makes sense to have all five. There are issues like Baltic security where it makes sense to have Sweden and Finland. And that's the group we're cooperating with. So we will tailor this to the issue, uh, which is the only way that it makes sense. We don't want to have a format. It's not a format. It's not mechanical. Uh, it has to be practical, focused on output and real mutual benefits, uh, and therefore flexible. Mm. Hall, can you have a reflection on that? No, I think we, with the, the, from the outset, that was the notion that this could be flexible and it should be adapted to the substance rather than to start with the format. Mm. It happened that there were five countries entering into this EUP at the time for the Wales summit. Um, and I guess that uh, more could be added uh, mm. later on. But at this point in time, it's five who have the EOP status. Uh, could be six, seven others coming in later. But at this point in time, and we try to play it like that. Um, when we see, for example, need for consultations and exchange of views on the Baltic Sea area, um, well, we, we then ask for a meeting 28 plus 2 mm. rather than 28 plus 5, mm. which, is a much, which gives much better discussions than if you have 28 plus 24 or 28 plus something else. We also have a Western European partnership, which is plus 5 plus 6. So it's, it, it all has to be tailor-made and flexible. Mm -hmm. It sounds a bit like, uh, there is one, I mean, it's one thing when you have international missions um, for a military non-allied country to, to participate. You have a, a special focus and it's further away. And now we are approaching, as you said, we, you, I think you, James, said you're coming closer to home. Or, and it's the same with Sweden, as, as Håkan made in his uh, introductory remarks, uh, more of focus on national defense. And uh, of course, there is an issue of uh, there is an Article 4 consultation process, there is Article 5, and uh, uh, is there an all open door in participating in exercises if the scenario, for instance, would be more of an Article 5 scenario for Sweden, or how, do, how, how is that coming about, that kind of discussion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no one to look at. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please. I mean, it, it's actually quite simple uh, for us, uh, and that is Article 5, of course, only applies to the 28. And we will exercise defense of the 28, first and foremost, at 28. We will ensure that all the capabilities we need for defense of the Allies are from within the alliance. We can't depend on any outside uh, actor, no matter how trusted and trustworthy for defense of the alliance, because it's a treaty commitment, and that's the way it has to be. Uh, however, uh, it is also the case that uh, an Article 5 uh, contingency which affected the alliance would have implications, or potential implications, for partners. And therefore, partners have an interest also, uh, and a legitimate interest, in seeing how this would affect them, how would it affect security in their region, uh, and therefore, in what way might they be associated with possible exercises relating to Article 5, which don't imply security guarantees or obligations on our partners, uh, but which might have implications for them where they would want to be uh, associated. And we are very open to discuss with them how that might work. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely, and and, and as you know, uh, I mean, it's a it's a national decision every time mm. to 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 come to the conclusion: are we to participate or not? But mm. and that's one of the points I tried to make that uh, the earlier we can mm. get consultations on future operations and exercises, and the more information we share, mm. um, the better. Uh, we are posted to, to, to take those decisions, whether it's Article 4 or Article 5, and we have to decide in Stockholm whether to go for it or not. Um, also there, the decision shaping process that has been uh, quite successful, I think, in, in international operations, that means that uh, as a partner, if you participate, you are in the decision-making process, but you are not at the table when the decisions are taken, but, but at an early phase you can actually influence mm. uh, the way things will move ahead. Um, if we're now moving more into um, exercise, not actual missions, but more of exercises and training and build up and so on, how does, uh, is that, and we, Sweden uh, remains military and unaligned, is that an applicable way of, of looking ahead because there would still be situations, I believe, where uh, Sweden would have interest in, in participating in, in shaping the way things are going ahead. Well, again, uh, Håkan will have uh, Sweden's view on this. I think our view is, first, that the decision shaping uh, has been very useful uh, for NATO, let alone for partners. And I'll give one example, and that is uh, for Afghanistan. Uh, as we went through the operational plans in detail, uh, yes, it was the 28 that gave final uh, approval of the operational plans and the political plans. But in fact, we even did it with the partners at the table. And the, the sequencing was uh, that the decision was taken at 28. And then we immediately asked to the partners, can you associate yourself with this? Uh, the partners that had participated in the shaping of that decision. So we didn't even want to separate the decisions at all. Uh, and one example was on the way in which intelligence and information would be shared between the forces participating in this operation. And our uh, force uh, contributing partners said, hey, this is not sufficient what you are offering NATO in the, a few years ago. And we want to change in the plan. And it was changed as a result of this very legitimate uh, point. And so we have a much better, <clears throat> or had a much better operational plan. But now, uh, you know, we mentioned all these issues that we're discussing. And it's not yet at the decision shaping phase because we're not taking any decisions on these issues. But we are definitely in the consultation, and in some might say pre crisis uh, consultation phase about what's happening here in the Baltic Sea, what's happening in Syria and Iraq, what's happening in Libya. Uh, these are all now consultations that are taking place with interested EOP. Uh, partners, so uh, we're at the pre, pre, pre uh, shaping phase, <laughs> and we're in the consultation phase. But when it comes to the uh, design of the crisis management exercise that's going on right now, the participating partners also had a say in the design. So really, I think we're moving in the right direction, even without the uh, decisions on operations that are taking place. By the way, of course, Sweden participated in shaping the RSM mission as well. Mm. A question to Håkan, perhaps more, uh, because there has been a lot of uh, attention uh, here uh, on the Swedish-Finnish military cooperation and how that has developed. A, a big uh, plan was launched here uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, also including both training exercises, uh, exchanges of various sorts, but also planning, not only for crisis management, but even moving into uh, actual war scenarios. Um, how does that fit into, um, uh, as you would say, or is this congruent with the development within NATO, or is this, this like a separate track, or how, how, how have you linked those two processes? Uh, because it appears that it's, you know, they're happening at the same time. You put me on the spot here. I'm, uh, I mean, it's, as I see it, it's, it's a complementary thing. We, we, we try to develop our cooperation now on, on different levels, bilateral uh, with Finland, with the Nordic countries, within the Nordefco context, and with the Baltic countries. Um, we're doing some things with Denmark, I mean, in the margin, um, when it comes to, to access to, uh, to uh, our, our air 
uh, airspace. But and uh, in, in the NATO concept, we we have daily consultations, uh, basically with fin our Finnish uh, colleagues, um, on the way ahead. Uh, so we keep each other informed on our deliberations with our capitals and, and try to move uh, move this together. Um, I don't see that as um, what what we uh, what we try to to um, the messages we try to send to Stockholm is of course that think of the NATO context now uh, when you do this or when you develop this bilateral cooperation. Um, so what we're doing there uh, is actually reinforcing what we're trying to do in the NATO context or vice versa. So And, and basically I think we, we go along those lines. Uh, so I don't see any competition here. Uh, then again in the end uh, we all know that uh, all initiatives end up at the finance ministry at some point. <laughs> so in that, in that sense, it's, it's, uh, it's of course, uh, a question of priorities. Any reflections on Sweden, Finland? No? I, I agree on the finance minister. Mm. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I think I'll open up the floor. I'm sure there are questions and reflections here from the audience. Uh, we have two microphones, and uh, please wait for that one and state your, introduce yourself, your name, and if you represent any organization. Um, Lennart Linnier. I was uh, at the Foreign Ministry um, for several years. Uh, now I'm retired. I would like to pose a question to Mr. Apatharai. Um, <clears throat> as the tension rises because of the Russian activities in Ukraine, annexation of Crimea and their activities in Ukraine. Uh, to what, what are the prospects, as you see it, for a permanent stationing of NATO troops, foreign NATO troops, in the Baltic states? And perhaps in particular, American boots on the ground. I'm not talking about continuing presence by rotation, I'm talking about the possibility of a permanent stationing in the Baltics. Second question, if I may, <clears throat> to what degree do the Baltic states, in your view, uh, get a little bit, um, how shall I say, negative perhaps on uh, when, when we in the EU talk about solidar the solidarity clause and we, uh, that for instance Sweden and Finland should help in case of another EU country being attacked and vice versa. To what degree do they express to NATO a certain nervousness about that saying we don't want to mix these two things. We have Article 5 and that's for us holy. The other solidarity clause is a much softer type of uh, arrangement and has not been tested. It's not treaty bound in the same hardcore sense. So these two questions. Thank you. Thanks. Um, on the first question, uh, and that is the prospects for permanent stationing, uh, I think you know, obviously, uh, in the NATO-Russia Founding Act, uh, we committed in NATO that based on the security environment as it was, uh, and as we hoped it would remain, uh, that we committed not to permanently station substantial combat forces in uh, the new member states. There are many who argue that the conditions have changed, but despite that, the NATO-Russia Founding Act is something to which the Allies are still all, all committed, including the Baltic states. Uh, and therefore, uh, what we have put in place, as I'm sure you know, is uh, what we call NFIUs. We, all, we have an acronym for everything, and then we call them nephews because we find the acronym <laughs> uh, odd. But basically, we're putting in a relatively small number of non-combat forces into each one of those countries. And by the way, not just into the Baltic states, but into six countries, maybe soon eight countries, uh, which is a permanent, no, sorry, which is an enduring presence. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the purpose of these uh, NFIUs is not combat, but to do basically three things. One is to be a presence a presence of non-Baltic countries there, including Americans, and Americans will be there. Second, to be able to receive 
the NATO rush, the NATO response force, and uh, in particular the very high readiness brigade. You know, you need reception facilities, and third, to organize exercises in the country. So they'll stay there as long as they're needed. Uh, but you're quite right when you say Americans. Uh, I think it was Conrad Adenauer. His the first part of his quote was famous. He was asked how many. Americans he needed to defend Germany and he said American soldiers and he said just one and then he said which doesn't always get quoted preferably dead because uh, they figure okay if he's dead then the Americans are definitely coming uh, so you know you're right that the presence of the United States forces are very very important politically they send a very strong signal but all the allies will be rotating through but the fact that they rotate you know, for those of you who have been in the military, and I understand many Swedish men have been in the military, in the end I find the difference to be a little bit artificial in that you never leave the same guy there for two years, 10 years, 15 years. There's always a rotation. Mm -hmm. The idea of these NFIUs though is that if the security conditions improve, uh, well then maybe they're not going to be needed anymore. But as long as they're needed, we will provide them. Um, and that brings us to, to this question of solidarity clause. I'll say two things. One is I have never heard a representative of the Baltic states express concern about the solidarity clause. I do hear them say, as you quite rightly say, Article 5 is the bedrock of their security, and it depends on NATO, and that includes the United States and the command structure of, uh, of NATO. The credibility of European defense is very much based on NATO and that applies as much to I don't mean EU defense I mean European defense is is the bedrock of it is is NATO and our EU friends say that as much as we do I think it was in fact in the latest EU security strategy so uh, they want NATO but I'm sure they welcome the solidarity clause as well thank you yes <clears throat> Henrik Sarander Swedish Academy of War Sciences. In the event of um, Swedish and or Finnish applications for membership, um, there would be uh, probably referendums on, on both sides uh, before or after applications, at least in the Swedish side. But regardless of what's happening on, in that case, uh, in Sweden and Finland, on the NATO side, how flexibly and especially how swiftly would such applications be handled in the event of them coming? You know, when I became NATO spokesman, uh, I had never spoken to a journalist before. Uh, that's the kind of training and job experience they look for, apparently. Uh, and uh, the, um, the Secretary General at the time, Jaap de uh said, you know, come in, here's only one thing you need to know. Never answer a question that begins with if. That was his only guidance. Uh, he followed it years later with don't make jokes after I made a joke, which didn't go down very well. Uh, but uh, those are the only two pieces of advice he gave. Um, but to get to, to the point, you know the basic position. I have to repeat it. It is utterly a national decision to choose the political orientation and associations of the Sweden and Finland, and we don't interfere in that, and we respect the decisions that the country's taken, that's all. However, uh, I am quite confident that uh, in terms of meeting the qualifications of membership, both countries have already done that and surpassed them uh, in terms of interoperability and co cooperation and values and political and democracy. So, uh, you know, there is a process in NATO which has basically two steps. One is the Allies would have to agree that it's a good idea. That's for any applicant. Uh, and then that could happen very quickly. And then there is a ratification process that has to take place in all parliaments. Uh, and that takes more time. So that's the process for any uh, applicant. But in terms of the standards, uh, I have no hesitation to say that the Allies would consider both Sweden and Finland to have met already the standards of NATO membership. Thank you. Now, where are we? Ambassador Lithuania, so I, I will probably not go to answering the, the previous questions, which I, I think, uh, the, thank you, James, for answering in a very elegant way. Indeed, uh, from the Baltic perspective, uh, and the, from other 
countries which were on the far front of the of, of, of NATO, uh, we definitely had vision to see in the wells uh, this uh, magic word permanent. But now there is not about the philosoph philosophical debate. Now it's about implementation of decisions. And here we are very certain that decisions of the Wales are need to be implemented. And we see substantial uh, progress in, in this. In the, we, yesterday there was an announcement of American moving Abraham sometimes to, to the Baltic countries. And this is actually today they are landing in Vilnius. We see constant exercises. So here we we, this is the secondary question, what we were wishing for. Now the key issue is to implement the decision of, of, of the Wales summit. The second issue, of, of course, also, uh, this is the, the, there was a question about the, but probably I will not probably go into, into, into this, into this uh, debate. But can I switch to another topic, uh, James? And again, thank you for coming already for the second time. I see you in, in, in Stockholm. Yeah. That means a strong commitment from NATO on Swedish security and NATO relations. Swedish NATO relations. My question is what you were alluding to the strategic communication. This is probably one area which still might be considered as a good uh, EU-NATO sort of uh, uh, cooperation issue where, you know, uh, <coughs> strategic communication, as you bluntly alluded, this is actually, uh, this is actually Russian propaganda, or Russian information war. So do you see, uh, and, and how, if you see, uh, NATO and EU can cooperate on this, in this issue? Because from the, from the Baltic perspective, from the perspective of Lithuania, we see now as this is the key issue. If we will not manage this, there will be long-term consequences in, in our countries, and that's why we definitely would be eager to see the progress. So thank you once again. Thank you, and um, I, I think it's a fascinating topic and an important topic. Uh, why? Uh, I'll give you a little anecdote, and that is my nephew, who's 19 years old and lives in, in Toronto, uh, called me uh, a while ago, a few weeks ago. I said, yeah, what are you? he said, what are you NATO doing? And you're encircling Russia, and you're threatening Russia. Uh, and you want to take down the Putin regime? I said, what are you talking about? Uh, and then I asked, you know, where are you getting your news? And he gets it from Russia today. And why does he get it from Russia today? Because he's out of school and he works in a grocery store and he doesn't have money to pay for cable. But who provides uh, their news for free around the world? Russia. And so in so many places, people who are of lower income including my own family members, uh, think uh, what they're being told to you know, a greater or lesser extent. If you look at the money being put into Russia Today and Sputnik alone, it dwarfs the BBC World Services budget. Uh, and it is being provided, as I say, for free, unlike in many cases the, the BBC World Service. Uh, and it is associated with a government-controlled message, targeted message, and it goes along with new media. Russia has two centers, troll farms, they're called, uh, in Russia. 200, 250 people each working in these troll farms whose job it is to work new media, and that is to get on the websites of all of our newspapers. If there's an anti-Putin article, they respond to it in the comments page. Then those comments are used back in Russia to say, you see, people don't support that article in country X. Uh, they send tweets, it's Facebook, uh, so it's new media and old media. They also, of course, fund NGOs, and not just in our countries, uh, pro-Moscow NGOs, but in partner countries where these things are at play. Georgia, seeing a very substantial increase in funding from Russia for NGOs who have a more pro-Russian pro, pro uh, perspective, etc., etc. So, uh, this poses a threat to us because, in essence, information is being weaponized. Uh, and I don't talk about the direct communication to uh, you know, Russian-speaking communities in our countries. Uh, the extent to which they really want to leave a NATO country or an EU country and go live in Russia, I really doubt. But it can cause difficulty and confusion. It can undermine governments. So uh, we do need to respond to it. The press services of NATO and the EU uh, are very much in touch with each other, coordinating on messaging. Uh, but in fact, uh, I just participated in Copenhagen in a Nordic Baltic 8 discussion on this issue, uh, where there's a lot going on. 
but uh, I think we soon need to move beyond the analysis phase and into the response phase. And that is, for example, clarifying what is actually happening. And here, uh, we have a real problem in, uh, in our own internal systems, which I think we need to get over, and that is the declassification of imagery. We're very difficult. Uh, we're very slow at doing that. So basically, the lie goes around the world before the truth puts its shoes on, as we say. Uh, and we need to, to, we need to move faster. We need to use imagery. We need to coordinate messaging, uh, including between the two organizations. But, and here I'll stop. It is a mistake, in my view, to rely on NATO or the EU to push back on Russian propaganda. Uh, it is up to the national governments. NATO has maximum 30 people who could work on this at any given point. Uh, the EU probably has more, because uh, the EU has more of everything, but, uh, but still. Uh, it is for national governments who know their own people, who have the mandate to do this and who have big budgets to do it, to push back, but they need to coordinate better. And if they coordinate, uh, NATO and the EU can play a role in helping in coordination. Uh, when I was spokesman, we set up a media operations center, you know all about it, and we had coordinated messaging because we were all tied together and we said the same things at the same time. And uh, we can do more of that, I think, now <coughs> with this new challenge. Thank you. Yes, please. My name is Shell Lundqvist. I am from the European Labour Party. The last statement was really funny. <laughs> I mean, this is exactly what's going on all over the West. Everybody has the same line about Russia really strange. So you already had, had won that. Uh, it's only the drops from Russia today that uh, uh, make that uh, man can s you can see it in a different thing. But that was not my question. I, I basically have two questions. You are talking about the South, and then you mentioned three countries, Libya, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, you can possibly add at least two, Afghanistan and Kosovo. And all these countries, which is in a total mess now, this mess was created by NATO or by leading NATO countries. As you know about Iraq, as you know about Libya, and as you know about uh, uh, Syria, it was heavily supported by NATO countries uh, to, to create this mess. And uh, this was my first question, Is this, uh, uh, was this the goal when the, uh, the NATO countries started these operations? Next question is about values. You are talking about values, but not the word, what is these values? For example, uh, do you think that uh, the NATO countries has the right for a regime change policy against other countries? Okay. Um, first, and thank you for the questions, um, I, I would say a couple of things. First, uh, what caused the instability in at least Libya, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, and Kosovo was not outside interference. What caused the instability in Kosovo was Milosevic's attack on the Kosovars. Nobody got involved in Syria, which many people say is the problem, uh, but certainly the fact that everybody lent back and allowed this thing to yeah. to continue uh, happen. Libya, I would half agree with you. I wouldn't agree with you that the operation that uh, led in the end to the toppling of the Gaddafi government was a mistake. There's a reason the UN ma mandated that operation, uh, and that was the threat to clear and obvious threat. Uh, of a great massacre. That's, and NATO enforced the mandate. People disagree with the ending of it, but it was UN mandated for a reason. Where I do agree with you, however, was in what came after. And that is the lack of international uh, engagement to stabilize Libya. And I had something to do with that. Not the lack of it, but trying to get it ha happening. I went twice to try to find uh, arrangements, but for a number of reasons, including that the Libyans asked us to go, uh, not us, everybody, to go, and that the UN mandate came to an end, as you remember, and NATO left, then uh, nothing happened. Uh, there was, the UN was there, and NATO was a little bit there, the EU was there, 
But uh, we didn't do enough. We didn't convince the Libyans to allow us to do enough, and I, I really regret it, and I think it was a big mistake on the part of the international community, frankly, that that happened. Afghanistan, we all know the origin of why the international community went into Afghanistan, uh, and eventually NATO uh, as well. So I, I don't necessarily agree with your analysis. You're not surprised. Uh, but I hope that we, in the case of Afghanistan, in the case of Kosovo, I really believe, uh, have contributed to more stability rather than, uh, rather than less. Uh, in terms of values, no, NATO has no policy of regime change, no intention to engage in regime change, uh, no support for regime change, and don't try to promote it. So there's a value we share with you. Any more questions, remarks? Yes. Uh, Bjorn Chinbe. Uh, James, what does uh, Jordan actually do concretely? I'm invited to go there as I'm interested. <laughs> what does it do, you know, in terms of security and with NATO? Is that with NATO? First, Jordan was for quite some time the biggest non-NATO contributor to the uh, international operation in Afghanistan, biggest, <laughs> uh, which is quite some set, with over a thousand troops. Uh, they were a major supporter for the operation, UN mandated operation uh, in Libya. And I think what is also very important to recognize is, is the crucial regional role that Jordan is playing as a uh, force of reason, of stability. They are under enormous pressure, as you know very well, uh, because of refugees uh, and the instability that's flowed across its border. You all know the terrible incident with their pilot. Um, so we, can, we consider that they are playing a very important regional role. Uh, the King of Jordan was in NATO yesterday uh, and came to uh, speak to us and uh, explain the regional security situation. That alone, uh, from their perspective, that alone is a very substantial contribution to our understanding of what's happening. When he was explaining all the different areas in which the different parties are trying to exert influence uh, and what we can do to respond to it, you know, he's really part of that uh, community and we really need that. I'll give you another example. Jordan has trained uh, Iraqi security forces uh, and has offered to partner with us if we can provide more capacity building to Iraq, but we don't necessarily want to do it inside Iraq, or the Iraqis don't want it inside Iraq. We can do some training, high-level training, potentially. We haven't finalized that uh, in Jordan. And the Jordanians are very knowledgeable and, for example, said to us, yes, we'll do the training, but we want ethnically balanced armed forces. We don't want to contribute to you know, the further breakdown uh, of the country. So. Their ability to reach in uh, in terms of understanding and analysis and concrete support uh, is very valuable. Another area which the, the King mentioned yesterday was de-radicalization uh, and contributing to this. And then I'll conclude. His point, and this, this comes I think to the heart of your question, in, in addressing the challenges of the South, it cannot be that we, the West, are the ones who take the lead because we will be seen as outsiders and rejected as outsiders. His point was, you, the West, need to help us, the countries of the region, Muslim countries of the region, to do it ourselves. And then people will understand uh, in the region that you are supporting us in our own internal, uh, to put it that way, a fight. So, I mean, for ev we have every reason to want deeper cooperation with a country like that. Uh, in a fight which affects all of us. But would that be uh, also a lesson from Afghanistan, or how do you apply that outside well, perspective going into a completely different well, environment? I, 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 it's interesting you mentioned that because Samantha Power uh, discussed this extensively yesterday as well. Uh, and her point was we need to invest much more in empowering regional organizations, local actors, uh, to solve their own challenges because we will either be seen as uh, outsiders or not as effective as local actors 
or in the case of NATO, Russia is not going to give us a Security Council mandate anyway, uh, at least not if it's just NATO taking the lead. I could be wrong, but it seems unlikely. Uh, so I think the general trend now is to provide more training and capacity building, not just to the countries that are NATO partners in Middle East and North Africa, but the US is providing training for six sub-Saharan uh, countries to improve their capacity to provide security in, in Africa. Uh, and the whole NATO training mission is designed to put on their feet 350,000 Afghan security forces precisely so we don't have to do it. But Afghanistan really had nothing when we went in. So we have invested billions, uh, and maybe not all of it uh, perfectly, but we've tried. We've invested billions to help them stand on their own feet so that we don't have to do it. Does that mean that uh, NATO will not... Um can we foresee a, a big organ, a big mission like Afghanistan or Kosovo or Libya, NATO-led within the coming years? So is that more or less out of the picture? No, I think it's not at all out of the picture. And, and here's the reason. Uh, what we saw out of Libya, I come from a defense ministry, so I, I look into the technicalities. And the Libya operation I found very revealing. There, the Libya operation had sort of two phases, as I'm sure you remember. It started as a coalition of the willing. And it's important to remember that this was a very simple and relatively small operation by major standards. It was in one, what we call an environment, just the air. No land, basically no sea. Uh, it was short uh, in an environment with no particular substantial military challenges. And uh, the U.S. commanded the coalition at the beginning. But when the U.S. decided it no longer wanted to provide command and control, there is no other place in the world that could command even that little operation except NATO. The U.N. can't do it. The E.U. can't do it. There's no country that can do it. It's only NATO. So if we are going to take on complex operations in future at all, there are only two options. The U.S. does everything commands and controls everything, or NATO will do it. So my conviction is that NATO will, and soon, I don't know where, be called upon to provide more substantial support because there's no other place to go. Uh, and because we have this very high level of capability, we have a command structure that is very sophisticated. We have political control over all aspects of the operation through the NATO Council, and we have a network of partnerships with highly capable partners, but around the world, which uh, has proven, for example, very valuable in Libya. So I'm sure we will be busy but uh, on operations, but right now, um, as you say, we're in a little bit of a lower phase. Mm. OK. Final questions. So we have a couple here. Let's uh, take them together. And the lady. Thank you. As well. Newspaper reported that the Russian ambassador went up to the number two in the Swedish foreign affairs to express concern if Swedish fighters were to use an Estonian base for landing during a planned uh, cooperation exercise. Have you got if the if the information is correct, have you got any kind of assessment of that kind of Russian move? Thank you. And then the uh, next question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Karen van Stegen, uh, head, Deputy Head of Mission of the Netherlands. Um, if I quote you correctly, uh, James, um, you just said that Sweden and Finland have uh, by far reached the standards for NATO membership. Does that also include defense spending? <laughs> yeah. um, okay, thank you. <laughs> coming back to the if, uh, I, I of course have no information about whether that happened. I can say one thing though, it is certainly up to those two countries alone to decide what military cooperation they have and no third party uh, has any say uh, over that. On defense spending, um, I mean, we have allies who unfortunately don't have the highest uh, level of defense spending. Uh, but we made a, and you know very well, there was a pledge made at the Wales Summit to stop the fall where there was a fall, 
and as economies improve to work towards 2% by 2020. It also asked for 20% investment in capabilities. Uh, so we would certainly expect any new member uh, to work towards those same targets. Uh, but of course, now leaving aside membership, because uh, I don't want to imply that I'm now linking these two things, uh, you know, these two countries, uh, despite you know, uh, whatever level of defense spending they have, uh, contribute very professional, highly integrated, uh, hi sort of highly interoperable, uh, and highly capable forces. Uh, and I'll give you an example, coming back again to the Libya operation. Uh, Swedish armed forces and air force have reached what we call, well, operational capabilities concept level two. It's a very high level of interoperability. Uh, and as a result, the next day after the Swedish government decided to participate, we're fully part of that uh, operation. And because of the high level of technical capability with regard to targeting, we had the lowest level of civilian casualties I have ever seen in an operation. I mean, this was, I come, again, I come from a defense ministry, this was historic. Uh, how few civilian casualties they were despite all these complex air operations uh, and that required very high level of sophistication and uh, amongst all the many other countries Sweden could do it uh, and I think the Swedish population should be very proud of, of their armed forces so uh, there's a lot to be proud of but of course defense spending in any country you won't hear a NATO guy say it shouldn't be higher it should always be higher <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, well, please. Um, just just to comment on that, because um, as I understand it, it's not for me to interpret uh, um, mm. what NATO has decided, but, but um, my impression is that the decision in Wales was an attempt to stop the decrease in defense budgets for the future, and, mm. and the aim was to, over time, uh, to get the member states to increase their defense budgets. Right now, I think, maybe there are five countries mm -hmm. of the allies who actually fulfill uh, that pledge two percent of the gdp um, and some are even decreasing uh, their defense budgets this year uh, so so this is and and may i add that one of our main tasks at the swedish delegation to nato besides working together with the allies to um, further advance our cooperation as a partner is to try to spend more time in awareness making because in the debate there's a lot of misunderstandings as we see it when it comes to facts and figures and we will try to uh, assist um, we welcome a debate on, on NATO in general um, but we will try to do what we can to actually provide the facts and, and the figures so we don't have to play around with with uh, misconcepts or misunderstandings and this is uh, this has been part of it because I've seen in the debate there has been some um, <coughs> arguments on um, the costs of a possible membership of NATO and, and then I normally I refer to Belgium or some other states mm -hmm. uh, and their uh, share of GDP so um, there are lots of things going around but uh, but we can we can do um, a whole lot of things to increase the correct information I think from our point of view well time is uh, running out and um, thank you so much uh, James uh, thank you Håkan for uh, joining us today and uh, sharing your thoughts and knowledge and uh, for uh, leading this discussion please uh, join me in thanking our speakers <laughs>